everybody, I'm Tim Bulock, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Training to Survive. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Training to Survive is a 1996 and 1997 era television show that was produced in and around my studio in Irving, Texas in that day and aired for three years on the local cable network, which covered all of Dallas and the Fort Worth Metroplex. After that, it spread out beyond cable companies from down in Houston and San Antonio were also airing the show. And the main theme of the show was more Kempo based, but we also opened the platform for a variety of other martial artists, okay? So what we're doing today is we're going back and we're recapturing and re-editing these shows and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. We're also putting modern and updated segments in a lot of these shows as well. So please support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel because it takes your support to keep this show coming out. There is zero profit in it, zero sponsorship whatsoever, okay? So tonight, this is episode 15 of season two. Uh, we've got a great show lined up for you tonight, something a little bit different. To start things out, we're going to go into a demonstration in an interview with Dr. Rod Sakranowski, who visited the school frequently back in the 90s. I did some video work for him, and he also uh, also recognized my rank back in that day, which was, a, uh, which was quite an honor all the same. So we have an interview that was conducted by Todd Boydston. Uh, from my school who did a bang up job on this interview so uh we've got that coming up i think you're going to find that uh exciting after that we're going to go to on the mat i've got a special segment there also tonight and this segment is geared more towards school owners and instructors as we cover and this got to remember this was filmed back in 1996 you know things evolve over the years but in that day, we cover how to teach a self-defense technique in an adult class. Now, this particular segment was, was filmed for a large martial art, arts organization back in that day, and it was actually a pretty popular seg segment. I got a lot of positive feedback from it, as well as some students from other schools that joined us just as a result of what they saw in this segment. And then lastly, to wrap things up, to kind of cap off with the, the opening segment with Dr. Rod Sakranowski, who's a... Uh, a, a Japanese practitioner. We've got judo from Reading Martial Arts. Uh, Professor Steve Flanagan, the head judo instructor up there, is going to give us a, a class on uh, on what you would learn if you were actually in the class taking the judo. So we got that coming up all the same. So hang in there with us and let's get this show on the road. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Bulot, the owner and the head instructor of the Academy of Kempo Karate located right here in Irving, Texas. Welcome to another edition of Training to Survive, the television show for today's martial arts 
and fitness enthusiasts. Whether you're here to learn self-defense or just to have a good sweat and workout and have a lot of fun, we've got something on our show for you tonight. So get ready for it and let's get started. Okay, let's get into our interview with Dr. Rod Sakranowski now. Dr. Sakranowski is a renowned expert on the Japanese martial arts, and he also created a system that he calls, he has titled Combat Key, which you'll see these guys in here taking some, some brutal shots, okay? Not something you would want to try without, uh, without some uh, training first. Now, in the first part of this interview, you'll see a demonstration of Japanese martial arts that was performed by Mary Sakranowski, and it is narrated by Dr. Rod Sakranowski. And after that, it's going to get into the interview with Todd asking a series of questions to uh, uh, to the doctor about uh, his experience and so forth, leading into the combat key. So uh, at this time in the 90s, uh, Juko Kai International, his organization was uh, a, a very large organization with a lot of membership and was world renowned for their activities. So let's get into this interview with Dr. Rod Sakranowski, presented by Todd Boydston. This tape pertains to Juko Ryu Toide, or what is known as the Taking Hand Art from Okinawa. This is a major division of Juko Kai International affiliated with Seidokan, Karate, Kobudo, and Toidi Association of Okinawa, Japan. As a point of interest before we begin this tape, which Sokodai Mary Sakranowski will be the main demonstrator, we would like to mention the fact that Toide is the oldest art on Okinawa. It is now 13 generations old. For 12 generations, it was a secret art, taught only to the firstborn male of each generation of the royal imperial family of Okinawa. This art was unknown to the Western world until Juko Kai was given permission by Sokotoma to introduce this system in the United States in the mid 1980s. Since that time, Tweedy schools in Juko Kai have expanded rapidly. We have them throughout the United States, Canada, and shortly we will have them in various foreign countries. Tawiti is a very special art. It is an art that is a blend of karate and a blend of aiki throwing techniques. In fact, <clears throat> many state that Tawiti is the actual grappling techniques of the old forms of karate on Okinawa. And when I speak of karate, I'm not speaking of sport karate or karate do. I'm speaking of karate jutsu or the combative system of karate. Hello, I'm Todd Voigtston and welcome to another edition of Martial Arts Today. I'm joined today by Dr. Rod Sakranowski. In addition to his many other accomplishments in the martial arts, Dr. Sakranowski is the only non-Asian founder to, be, to receive full recognition as a 10th Don and sponsorship and certification in both Okinawa and Japan. Welcome, Rod. Very happy to be here. Now, Rod, you've been studying martial arts for, for almost 50 years. Now, how did you get interested? When I was a young boy in grade school, I was 10 years of age in the year of 1950, uh, a friend of mine invited me down to a judo class one night at the old YMCA in my hometown. And uh, <clears throat> I had never heard of judo, so I went down, watched the workout, and got me hooked. <laughs> Started at that age and been at it ever since. Really? Now, you said judo. Have there, are there any other traditional martial arts that you've studied other than judo? Numerous. I've uh, studied most of the traditional arts of Okinawa and Japan during the past 46 years. Now, you hear the term judo, jiu-jitsu, aiki jiu-jitsu. What are the differences in those arts? Do they have a common origin? or? Well, the, ma the major difference is, is any art that ends with a J-U-T-S-U is a combat system. Mm. And any art that ends with a D-O 
is pretty much categorized as a way or non-combative martial art. So Aiki Jujutsu, Jujutsu would be a combat art, founded on a field of combat for the purpose of combat. Uh, karate Do, Aikido, things along that line, Kendo, uh, can either be a competitive sport or a non-combative system. Okay. Now I understand you had a very special introduction to Okinawan Judo uh, during a uh, Judo competition in Okinawa. Well, really, what uh, I was the head instructor for the 3rd Marine Division on Okinawa, and uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Japan and visit the Kodokan, which is where Jigoro Fano, uh, Kano founded Kodokan Judo. Mm -hmm. And while there, we uh, seen a gentleman that could be no taller than maybe five foot at the very most, weighed 130 pounds. Really? His name was Mifune, and he was one of the... Uh, Li few living tenthons in judo at that time and we watched him work out and even at his advanced age up in his 60s or 70s whatever he was in the year of 1960 uh, he was taking people my size and throwing them with ease one right after another and it made a very profound impression upon me and uh, kind of uh, gave me a new outlook on judo that's amazing now judo <clears throat> it's been said that judo is really no longer a, a viable combat art. What's your opinion on that? Well, all judo that's taught today, uh, the largest majority is sport judo. Oh. And there's no combative aspects to it. They've uh, long replaced the combative aspects with the sport judo competition aspects. And uh, that, a lot of people don't seem to understand that. In fact, uh, I'm an old sport judo man of 40 some odd years. And uh, these the old combat techniques that were originally taught ha are no longer taught. Really? Not in the United States, not in the West. Hmm. Well, you, you had practiced uh, judo and, and other martial arts for so long. Why, what was your, your inspiration or your reason for developing Joku Kai, for, for coming into a new art? Well, I, uh, tr I received all my training in Japan and Okinawa and studied all the tradi most of the traditional arts. I don't want to say all of them. Uh, and uh, I just felt like coming back to the West, there was a lack of this type of training back here. So by developing Juko Kai International, I incorporated most of what I learned under my ideas of what it should be as far as effectiveness goes and uh, thought I could do something to get some of these good systems going in the West. So that's why I developed Juko Kai International in the year of 1961. 61. Hmm. It's three years old. Now, <laughs> what exactly is Joku Kai. I mean, what, is it, what does it mean? How did it get its name? Well, uh, Mr. Ishikawa, Ninth Don Kodokan Judo Master, who was one of my instructors, we sat down in the late 1960s in his dojo in Philadelphia, and I was looking for a name to term my art. So it was his suggestion, Ju, J-U, meaning gentle, and Ko, K-O, meaning hard. So with that term, kind of like Goju, hard, soft, uh, with that term I was able to... Uh, pretty much uh, give a title to my martial arts as a soft, hard, since we represented both. Now, I, I know a main part of Juko Kai is the practice of ki. I, you hear ki mentioned in many martial arts circles. What exactly is ki? Ki is uh, internal energy is basically what it means. And uh, really what you can define it as is coordinated energy between the mind and the body, a very high level or a very high state of training uh, as to where you build and develop internal power. A weightlifter lifts weights to develop external power. Uh, in the martial arts, we practice certain techniques to build internal power. And what's the benefit uh, to practicing Qi as compared to some of the other martial arts? Well, we're world renowned, as you know, uh, for doing combat Qi. It's a system that I develop. It's a one-of-a-kind art. This enables our practitioners to take full power strikes and kicks to the vital areas of the body without any type of injury. Now there's two phases to key. Uh, the second phase deals with health, longevity, and internal powers uh, such as in Aikido that would uh, give you a, a little more power in the throwing arts, things along that line. Really? Well, now, this was pretty amazing. I saw you do a demonstration one time where you, you held your arm out stiff and someone was able to bend your arm, but you relaxed it and three grown men were not able to, to even budge your arm. Now, does key increase strength? or how, how does that work to where you're able to keep your arm completely stiff with three grown well, men? The hardest thing for a martial artist to understand is they equate, normally equate everything with power, right. external power. 
But when you develop key and you develop it properly internally, uh, the best way I can say that to you is, uh, or explain this to the audience is, you take a hose. Uh, with no water in the hose, you can bend the hose. Right. Well, when you put water in the hose, it then becomes a solid. You can't bend it. And the same principle applies with key. Uh, by putting energy down my arm, it becomes like a steel rod. You cannot bend it. Yeah. And uh, so it's, a, it's the same principle, just a little different. Wow. That, how long would it take the average person to, to accept full power punches and strikes? using? Usually it's up to the individual. Uh, I would say a minimum of two to three years to get ready to go out and demonstrate it uh, with people like yourself that are black belts that can hit with some measurable amount of power. Uh, as a point of interest, we've been struck in the past 35 or 40 years, we've been struck by just about everybody in the martial arts, including world boxing champions right on down, and uh, never had a bruise yet. Speaking of that, I saw a demonstration <clears throat> that you did at the Dallas Cowboys training camp where you mm -hmm. had Randy White, who at the time was the strongest person on the team, and, and Herschel Walker, who was in the martial arts. <clears throat> now, these guys are not small by any means, and they're able to generate hundreds of pounds of, of force behind their punches. Mm -hmm. Now, how is it physically possible to accept that, that type of punishment? When you, they're doing a lot of scientific uh, research on internal energy, and uh, we've been doing uh, with a lot of medical people over the years. The only way that we can explain this is that once you develop the mind, you can, it's like an invisible shield out of internal energy that just permeates the body, and you can put it to any area of the body within an instant uh, by simply thinking the thought. And uh, I think uh, my personal explanation is that uh, when you get struck, this invisible shield actually absorbs the power of the strike and dissipates the energy from the strike. Therefore, we receive no injury or no bruises. Okay, so physiologically you can accept the punishment, but they've got mm -hmm. to feel the pain. Well, they do when they first start, and then uh, it's like anything else. Uh, after accepting repeated strikes and kicks, uh, you learn how to uh, uh, diminish the pain. You don't think about the pain. What you're, the thing that you're concentrating on is uh, really watching the blow and the kick. Really? Well, okay, you talked about um, accepting blows and punches and, and kicks and so forth. Now, what about, uh, you, had, you had mentioned that you can deliver the same force or more mm -hmm. from a four inch punch than you can from a, a, a full, uh, full range punch. Now, how is that possible? Well, uh, I don't know if you ever watch boxing or not. But you take a boxer, a good boxer, some of his strongest punches are from the front of the body. Uh, it's a big misconception in the martial arts that you have to pull the hand all the way back to the side and that's going to give you more power. Actually, it decreases power because from back here as you strike, the pressure goes to the wrist. And usually, as you'll notice, when you first started training, the wrist will buckle. Right. Well, uh, the shorter that you can make your blow, and then, of course, when you put this principle of key, in behind the blow where you have instantaneous explosive energy, the stronger the punch will be. It's an internal punch now as opposed to the basic muscle punch that most people utilize. Okay. Well, how does this tie in then with uh, a demonstration that I saw you do? You were giving a, a demonstration in Japan at a, a police station and you had 14 people, some from the audience, some of your uh, mm -hmm. instructors, lined up and with one punch you knock the entire line down. And it wasn't just a domino effect. I mean, they, mm -hmm. the last person went well, flying. The 14 was a, a very small amount of people. I, uh, a few years back when we were in the Dallas area, I went to Richland College and we took, I think it was between 25 or 30 people from the audience. And uh, we also had this filmed and I was thinking about putting this in the uh, record books, but I didn't want Juko Kai to appear to be a carnival type atmosphere, so I didn't do that. Uh, we take our training very, very seriously. And uh, so I struck these uh, 25 people, and of course the actual photograph shows the first two came up off of the floor, and these were 200-pound men. And then at the same instant, the photograph shows that in the center, they're already down on the floor. And at the same instant, the last man is moving back like he'd been struck full focus in a chest. So uh, when we completed this strike and, and uh, did this for the first time, Everybody in that line said it felt like they had been kicked or punched to the chest, even the last man. 
a tremendous, they felt the same amount of impact to the rear as they did to the front. And you could literally see the key lines. So going. it transfers throughout the entire line. Oh yes, line. went right on through everybody in there. And it was quite an amazing thing. And uh, the only negative thing about that is when you're striking 4,000 pounds of immovable, uh, you know, uh, weight there, then of course uh, the striker, you feel that up oh, your really? arm and whatever. So you literally have to apply your key to go all the way down that line. You go through the line, and that takes a lot of training. It's pretty difficult to do. Wow. Now, are, are there, is key practice in any of the other martial arts tradition? Yes, uh, you'll find it in Aikido, is famous for it and whatever, but certainly not to the uh, combat levels that we incorporate it as. What are your, uh, I presume this something like key training must take a long time. What type of methods do you use to train? Well, if I, if I was going to start to train you, mm -hmm. the first thing I would have you do is I would say, make up your mind you want to train. Second thing I'd have you do is go home and get a paddle. Where it has a handle up here and it has a little paddle here that would fit between your legs. Okay. Now this is where 90% back out after the first day. And you get up there and get in your skivvy shorts. And then without looking down, you give yourself 20 good whacks to the groin with no protection on. You know, we don't wear protection when we do this. We take these full focus kicks to the groin and whatever. And uh, uh, by the way, while I'm saying this, there is no such thing as putting your groin up into the body. I've never seen that. Uh, when we take these kicks, we take it full focus right in the testicle area. But you would do that, and then I would ask you the next day, how do you feel? Well, about 98% of the people say, I want no more. Now, if you can get by that, I'll let you do that for three, four weeks. Then we'll take you in and work the paddle on you, and then we start moving you progressively to other areas. And, uh, but the groin is the one that everybody's most afraid of, and that's the hardest one to get over. I can imagine from the demonstrations mm -hmm. uh, that I it's saw. It's mainly up to you is how bad you want it. <laughs> <laughs> well, can anybody learn, uh, can learn key? Yes, we train anybody. In fact, I've had females go through the full key program. And uh, females take an actual same power blows that men take to the chest, ribs, groin, and whatever. Really? Uh, I know something like this obviously can't be learned overnight. You mentioned that uh, you progressively go harder, move into different mm -hmm. areas. Is that how the, the belt structure works, or at least the ranking? How, how do you know when you've achieved the next step in key? You can, uh, we, I'll give you a quick, simple answer for that. When you can stand up and I can hit you and you're still standing there, then I know you've passed your test. That's the simplest way I can state it, because as you learn it, I'll stand you up and then I'll say, shut your eyes and give it to you full focus. And if you're still standing or you can get back up off of the floor, then I know that everything I've taught you has been done right. So that's the quickest way to explain that. I'd hate to be the one that and, uh, uh, didn't quite learn it. <laughs> well, we do have some people that go through all the key training to get up to the very end to take the test. And you know, we put a blindfold on people and have them go down a line and everybody, six and eight guys at a time, lay it on them full focus at one time. And uh, they get to that point of the test and fail their exam because they can't get through the final test. Really? So there's quite a bit to it. It's not an easy thing. I have maybe, you can count them on two hands of the people that I have trained that are super good in key. Really? Well, how long does it, to, to really use it on the street or wherever you may need it, how long does it really take to try? A year. At a least basic, one year. Of a year to be able to take a basic punch to the vital areas, the throat, chest, or a full focus kick to the testicles, about a year. What about uh, achieving a black belt since that's everybody's um, usually first goal is black belt. What did, how long does it take to reach to receive a black belt? Well, if you were in Japan or Okinawa, you could do it in as little as a year to two years. But under Juko Kai, we do not uh, do it like this. When I developed Juko Kai, we developed a total combat martial arts organization that combined all these traditional arts. So therefore, when you make your first degree black belt, say maybe Shunru Karate, your second degree black belt has to be in a totally whole different system. Then when you master that, you get your second degree black belt. Get your third degree black belt, you may master the sword. And it goes on and on to get up to 10th Don. So by the time you make 10th Don, you have already mastered about every known martial art in Okinawa in Japan. Really? That's a very unique grading structure. I don't know of anybody else that does it like that. I can definitely see the benefits. It gives you a lifetime of study, and that's what you want. Most people will study one art, and after two years, they've learned the whole art and are ready to step away. This keeps your mind going for the rest of your life, and that's what we like. That's, that's good philosophy. Never stop learning. Well, Rod, I appreciate you joining me. It's a fascinating art, and I uh, look forward to seeing you back again. And thank you for joining us, and I'll see you on the next edition of Martial Arts Today.
Now that's what I call unbelievable, but keep in mind that Dr. Sakranowski and his team of key practitioners are the best in the world at it. And before you run out and start punching each other in the throat, it takes years and years of practice to get to that level, and it should not even be attempted without supervision. So if you want any more information on key training, you can contact Dr. Sakranowski at the following address. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up that interview. Very well done, good information. And Todd, that was a that was an outstanding interview. I was listening as I was reading to the show to uh, Rod's comments after the interview, and I don't know if you remember, but he congratulated you, and he himself commented on, on how good of an interview that, that that was. I mean, for someone that, you know, this was a weekend hobby for you, very, very well done. So I hope y'all found that enlightening, and uh, that's a good example of martial arts uh, from that day. Okay, that's gonna lead us into our next section, and this next section of On the Mat that we have coming up. Um, I did a segment, a piece for NAPMA, National Association of Professional Martial Artists, back in that day that was geared towards school owners and instructors to give them some guidance on how to teach self-defense to adults, okay? So in, in that time, my school was mainly focused around adults. We had a strong kids program, as you've seen in some of the, uh, in some of the videos, but uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, at this time I was running 200, 200 plus students and, you know, 75% of those were adults, okay, and, and the rest were kids because I, I think Kempo and the, uh, the aggressiveness of it kind of caters more toward adults and then, yeah, you know, me with my background of law enforcement, you know, I was there, I was all about teaching adults. So we, we focused on adults and then uh, w w the kids program was kind of a, a byproduct and, and most of the kids in the class, their parents were, uh, um, were students as, as well. So in this particular segment, I'm gonna break down in, in that day, the formula that I use to teach self-defense and like I said, if you're a school owner or an instructor, this will still help you today because things haven't changed that much. We still go by the numbers and break them down into you know, our static and our fluid and, and, and working up into a, a dynamic mode. Uh, and Kempo talks quite a bit about learning in the ideal situation before you put things up to uh, street intensity. And that's just some of the things that I'm, I'm talking about here. So let's delve into this section from 1996 uh, teaching self-defense for school owners. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Bulot. I'm the owner and the head instructor of the Academy of Kempo Karate here in Irving, Texas. Uh, one of the things that I found out to be extremely helpful about the NATMA program is that we all tend to get together and share what information has helped us in our schools. And today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, teaching self-defense to adults. Now here at our school, we've got uh, just under 200 students and only about 35 of those our, uh, our children. So the majority of our clientele here is adults and the main reason why is that they're attracted to our self-defense program. Now I find that the adults, they'll come in for a lot of various reasons. They like to get in shape, punch and kick and so forth, but they all really enjoy and appreciate learning that self-defense technique in every class. Now here we teach 24 self-defense techniques for each belt all the way up through third degree black belt. Now I'll agree that that's a little bit on the heavy side, but nevertheless I suggest you develop maybe eight to ten good solid self-defense techniques for each belt and when you test the students on these self-defense techniques for the next belt, come back and hit the old techniques again. That way they're going to stay with them and they're going to take them throughout their training. Now, when you teach a self-defense technique, you need to kind of explain it to the student like it's a kata but with an attacker, okay? It's there to teach certain principles of motion and on the street you may not necessarily do the self-defense technique just like you learned it in the school, but nevertheless, the more techniques against the more situations you can adapt and change and deviate from one move to the other. And what we try to do is get the student in to where they're in such a uh, mode that no, no matter how they're aligned to their attacker, that somewhere in their training, they've addressed that situation or at least a similar situation and they can start to formulate uh, these answers on their own. Now, I've been around to a lot of schools around the country and I've seen a lot of instructors that have either weak self-defense programs, they have the students develop their own techniques and maybe they don't have the skill level to be doing that yet, or they don't teach the technique 
correctly. Now what we're going to go over today is I'm going to teach you a method that I have found for teaching a self-defense technique the right way. Now before we start I'm going to show you the wrong way and this is the most common way I see techniques uh, taught and so forth and I got two of my uh, instructors here Mr. Rodell Bird and Mr. Josh Husey that are going to um, that are going to help me today. Now here's what I see a lot and this is and I've done a lot of research on programming motor skills and motor functions of the human body and this is the wrong way to teach a um, self-defense technique but say you guys are just white belts and we're going to learn a beginner bear hug technique okay guys now I want you to follow along with me here okay so we're going to pin and we're going to hit and we're going to clear the arms and we're going to slice the eyes and punch and then we're going to elbow and slide up and kick okay and then maybe have these guys work that back and forth now what I call this is not learning the technique but just following along okay and when you just follow along uh, you're not going to learn the fine details of the technique you're not going to learn what works and what doesn't work and you're not going to have a chance to decide for yourself what you like about the technique so I gave the guys the whole technique in one move and had they been white belts they would have gotten frustrated uh, maybe not came back to class the next day but they wouldn't have gotten everything out of the technique that they needed now I'm going to show you a way to get more mileage out of your self-defense technique. So when you're after you do your warm-ups and you do your drills and you're getting towards the end of the class, you know, you may be thinking, geez, I feel like I'm doing the same old thing. Well, you can always fall back on teaching a new self-defense technique. And if you do it this way, you can take in 20 minutes one technique, they're going to get a good workout, they're going to appreciate it, and they're going to walk out of your school feeling like, man, I can really do this technique, I know it well. Okay? Now we're going to break learning self-defense down into three phases. The first phase is going to be static phase, okay? And we refer to static is by the numbers, okay? Now you can do this with any self-defense technique. I'm going to use a beginner bear hug technique for an example. If you like this technique, take it, adopt it into your system. If not, try applying this to the way that you teach your other techniques or to the techniques you already have. Okay, now assuming that these guys are beginners here. Okay, all right, gentlemen, today we're going to learn a uh, self-defense technique against a rear bear hug arms pin. By arms pin, I mean that the attacker is grabbed and he's got both of your arms locked in against your body, okay? Now, the situation here is going to be that we're somewhat ready for the attack, okay, because we're just beginners. Now, let me interject real quick. You're going to have students that say, well, what if the guy he just picks me up and he throws me on the ground and I'm caught by surprise? One technique at a time. You've got to explain to them, we'll get to that, but we've got to start at a beginner level, okay? So in this situation, I'm going to tell the students in advance that they're somewhat prepared. Okay, gentlemen, moving on. Now, I'm going to take it from a situation that perhaps I hear somebody behind me. Josh, you're going to be my first attacker, just, not just yet. I hear somebody behind me. My level of awareness is somewhat peaked by what I've heard or what I felt. Okay, so as the attacker grabs, what I want you all to do is I want you to pin the arms, and I want you to step and lower your height, okay, to align yourself to shoot a hammer fist right to the groin. Okay, let's look at this again. He grabs, pin step, and I hit. Okay, one more time. He grabs, I drop my height, I pin and I hammer. Okay, now let's do that together in the air. Ready? And move. Good solid horse stance. Ready? And move. Okay, now right here, I've walked them through it a couple of times. I'm going to turn and watch them do it so I can make whatever corrections are needed. Ready? And move. Good. Now don't raise this hand. You want to hit from point of origin. Just drop and hammer. One more time. Ready? And move. Okay, guys, I want you to work that back and forth on each other. Okay, Rodell, why don't you tack Josh first? Okay, and let's work just that one move. And hammer, good. Okay, back and forth. Remember to step as he pins. You're a little late there, okay? Let's try it again, Rodell. Okay, grab him again, Josh. Step with the pin. There we go. Okay, now back and forth. Now, at this point, I'm going to keep them practicing, but I would have them do this one move 15 to 25 times, okay? Just the one move. Now, you may be thinking, geez, they're going to get bored. Well, you want to be bored or you want to be good at your self-defense, but for them to walk out of here feeling like they know it, 15 to 25 times is the uh, magic number. Okay, guys, go ahead and break. Now, we're going to take it that they've done that 15 to 25 times. Now, let's put the next move in here. Remember, we're static by the numbers, okay? Now, guys, as we pin, step, and we hammer, okay, we want to get a reaction out of them to loosen this grip. Now, if we don't hit them hard enough, we can always hit them again. But what I want you to do now is drag your cat stance, and I want you to push the arms apart by using your left palm here and a back elbow against the other arm, okay? Now, slow and easy. Josh, come up and grab. Okay, so we're going to go one as I hit and two as I part the arms, okay? Again, back up, start fresh, okay? We go one, hammer, and two, part the arms. Good. Okay, guys, let's do it together. Slow and easy. So we go one, 
two. Good, part the arms. Okay, ready? And one, two. Good, now with me watching, again, ready? And one, two. Okay, now, this is static mode by the numbers. I want you guys to do this 15 to 25 times on each other with no resistance here. Just use yourself as a target, okay? Rodell, why don't you grab first? Okay, one, pin step and hammer, and two, no resistance. Good, okay, now like I said, 15 to 25 times I'm gonna let these guys practice this, and if I had a class, I would kind of move down the line to make sure the other students are doing it right while they continue to practice. Keep them going slow at this point, no resistance. This is by the numbers. Okay, gentlemen, good, and break. Let's go to the next move of the technique. All right, so one, pin step and hammer. Two, part the arms. Now I'm gonna slice the eyes with my left hand. I'm gonna stomp the toe if it's there with my right foot and I'm gonna shoot a chopping punch right down to the front of the body, okay? And three, good, drop it in. Let's do it again, guys, ready? One, hammer, two, part, and three. Shoot your punch. Now let me show you how this looks with the body. Josh, let me bar you. Okay, as I pin, step, and hit, I get a reaction out of them to loosen the script. I part. I remember I told you the self-defense techniques were like katas. I'm going to teach them a new way to punch here that's going to, that they're going to carry with them. But I'm going to shoot on this move. I'm going to slice the eyes, stomp the foot if it's there, but I'm going to shoot a chopping punch that gouges whoosh, right down the front of the body. Okay, let's look at it again. Slow and easy. Hammer, part, whoosh, and shoot the punch. And the reaction of your attacker from then would probably be to back up and cover his eyes. Okay, one more time in the air, guys. One, two, and three, good, and with me watching. Ready, one, two, and three. Okay, back and forth on each other, 15 to 25 times. No resistance. Now once again, by the numbers, they're gonna work it back and forth and let them practice. Okay, now after they've done this 15 to 25 times, we're gonna go on to the next move, and as you can see, they're getting it as we're going along here, okay? It's, they're, they're, they're starting to get a little bit of a workout here, they're practicing and refining their skills, and I would be making the necessary corrections as we go along while we're in this static mode, in this by the numbers mode. Okay, gentlemen, to the, uh, the next move, okay? We're gonna go one, pin step and hammer. Two, part the arms. Three, slice, punch, and stomp. Now as your attacker backs up, I want you to shuffle in and use an obscure elbow. Come right up the front of the body, right under the jaws, okay? Josh, let me demonstrate this on you. No resistance here. Hammer, part, Slice and punch. Now, say you cover your face there because I, and the elbow fits right in here as I shuffle in, okay? Let's look at it again with an attacker. One, and notice I'm giving them visual examples as we go along. Two, three, and four, okay? And just like we did in the previous sections. All right, guys, 15 to 25 times. Work it slow and easy, no resistance, back and forth. Rodell, you attack first. And okay, now we're kind of speeding up things here to stay within the segment. But at this point, I would walk around, check the next group, the next group, make the corrections, let these guys practice it slow and easy as we build up our technique and so forth, all right? All right, guys, that's good. So we've got our 15 to 25 repetitions in on this one, all right? And we're going to come back and we're going to finish the technique, okay? Still in static mode, one step at a time. They get a little bit better as we add each move. Okay, final move. Let's do it together first, guys. So we go one, hit, two, part, three, slice and punch, four, shoot your elbow. Now right from here, we're gonna slide up and shoot a back kick to any target and then cover out of the situation. Okay, now with the demonstrator, Josh, let me bar you. One, two, three, four, and then I'm gonna slide up and kick him. Okay, let's do it together. Ready? One, two, three, four, and five. Good, okay, let me see you guys do it. Ready? In the air first. Ready, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, gentlemen, 15 to 25 times, okay? Now, as they practice this, we've completed our technique, okay? And we're just gonna let them work this 15 to 25 times, back and forth. Now, once again, at this point, I would make my rounds around the class, have my assistant instructors helping me check each student and make sure they're right. Keep it slow, guys, no resistance. This is static mode, okay? Remember, we're pretending to be white belts here. Static mode. Okay, good. That's good break, gentlemen. Okay, now let's go on to phase two of learning a self-defense technique. We're gonna call this, this is called fluid mode. And what fluid is, is gross, continuous movement, okay? Still with no resistance, but we're gonna up it to a good practice speed. Gross, 
Continuous movement, okay? So, all right, gentlemen, let's put the whole technique together, all right? Let's do it in the air first. We're going to pin step, hammer the groin. Now, we're going to go to a uh, four count. We're going to make the part of the arms and the slice, punch, and stomp all one move on two. We're going to shuffle on three and kick on four. Good. Again, ready? One, two, three, and four. Good. Again, ready? One, two, three, and four. So even brown belts need guidance. Ready, and one, two, three, and four. Okay, guys, y'all feel comfortable with that? Okay, let's do the whole thing in the air, in the air, on one count without me talking. Ready, and move. Okay, this is what we call fluid mode. Okay, relax, guys. Ready, and move. Okay, now, we're going to take that 15 to 25 times on each other. No resistance, no injuries here. You guys are going a little bit quicker than white belts would. But once again, stay relaxed. The con continuous, complete technique. And back and forth. Okay, once again, 15 to 25 rounds. I'm going to make my rounds around the class. I'm going to check the other students, make sure everybody's doing it okay. Still working the same technique. See, these guys are really starting to get a workout of it. And they're learning the technique. Now, this particular technique is one that we teach to white belts in the school. It's very easy to learn, especially if you teach it in this mode, okay? Okay, smooth, guys. Okay, smooth and fluid. Okay, and one more for Mr. Bird. Okay, good, and break. Okay, phase three of the technique is dynamic mode, okay? At dynamic, what we call street intensity, all right? Now, use your discretion on which students you're going to let take uh, to this level. A lot of the times, I don't even let my white belts go to phase three, which is the dynamic phase, okay? But uh, as they get up into, into rank and so forth, uh, sometimes we'll do it and we'll use extra padding and protection and so forth. Now, one thing I like to do when I um, take things up to dynamic mode is sometimes add some verbal uh, intimidation in there because I found a lot of the attacks out on the street are, are either prefix or a verbal, some kind of verbal command is or verbal intimidation is thrown into the attack and you got to get your students used to hearing that. So people say, hey, before they punch or yell at you at the same time they grab. Okay, now I'm going to pump them fast in the air a couple of times. Okay, guys, complete technique with a, in the air with a good key eye, with a good key eye and good intensity. Ready and move! <laughs> There we go. Now see, I raise my tone of voice. Just my tone of voice is really pumping these guys up. Ready and move. Okay, good. All right, let's try that on each other. Okay, Rodell, you're going to grab first, all right? Now, when we're doing this, you've got to react like you're getting hit. You've got to fall back from the attack and so forth. And Josh, I want you to pump it up to street speed, but I still want you to use good control. Let's scoot up just a little bit here. Okay? Now, another thing I want you to add, Mr. Burgers, I want you to add some verbal intimidation. Josh, I want a good loud key eye and go. Good, all right, and rotate out. Now cover out strong, watch your attacker, gentlemen. There we go. Okay, and once again, you guys keep working that. Once again, 15 to 25 reps on this. And I would make my rounds around the class. Okay, that's good, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Okay, y'all are done. Okay, like I said, three modes for teaching a self-defense technique. Static which is by the numbers, fluid, gross, continuous movement, and dynamic, street intensity. Depending on what size of class you have, I like to have a lot of coaches, a lot of assistant instructors floating around the floor with me just to keep injuries down to a minimum. Uh, here at my school, students love it. We try to end each class with something like this. You can see there's an aerobic workout. They get used to working that real environment, street self-defense. And because of the amount of repetitions, like I said, what do you want to do? You want to get bored? or you want to know the technique. They never leave bored, okay? They leave here feeling like we have really learned that technique and I could do it because by the time they've done, they've uh, put in a couple of hundred reps at that technique. And we've been at it for almost 20 minutes and you can see that the guys have gotten a pretty good workout. It's a great way to end your class. So work on it, static, fluid, and dynamic. I hope you get something out of it and we'll see you on future uh, sessions of NAPMA in the classroom. Reading Martial Arts has a lot to offer. They teach Kenpo, Jeet Kune Do, Jiu Jitsu, and Judo to adults and children. Okay, that's, that's a lot for under one roof. 
and uh, Mark Redding has done a hell of a job putting all those programs together. Now, this segment tonight on Modern Martial Arts is going to be conducted by Steve Flanagan. Stephen Flanagan is the lead judo instructor at Reading Martial Arts, one of the one of the systems that they teach up there. Now, judo um, was the first commercially taught martial art in the United States, at least as far as my re research has shown, and to this day is probably one of the most popular martial arts out there. And when taught, you know, correctly, it is extremely street effective. Now. Like myself, Professor Flanagan is a, uh, uh, a veteran police officer, so he brings that aspect, that experience uh, to his teaching. So let's go now to Denton, Texas. Let's visit Reading Martial Arts, see what their judo program is all about. Hi, my name is Stephen Flanagan. I'm the head judo instructor at Reading Martial Arts up here in Denton, Texas. Um, judo is a deri derivative of jiu-jitsu, so it originated back... Uh, with Jigoro Kano in Tokyo, Japan. Um, he started the Kodokan Judo Institute in 1882. So the techniques we're gonna be doing today are original techniques from the Kodokan. So the first one we're gonna do is called Deashi Harai. It means forward foot sweep. So what I'm gonna do is my uke here is gonna be stepping forward and I wanna catch him in that motion. So when somebody steps, the foot comes up and then it comes back down to land. As it comes back down, I wanna catch it before it hits the ground. So if I do this correctly, it's like he's stepping on a, on a uh, banana peel. So each time, as he steps forward, I wanna anticipate that and catch it. What I'm doing is I'm turning my foot so that the bottom of my foot creates that C right there. And that part of my foot will connect with his just like a glove right on the side of his foot. So I'm not kicking, I'm not trying to knock him off his feet. All I'm doing is just sweeping the foot away. So again, as he steps forward, my foot turns, I catch it and just move it off to the side. Now in judo, we have what we call kazushi or the decentralization of balance. If I just moved his foot, he would just reestablish his balance. So what I wanna do is, as he steps forward, as I do this, this hand is gonna to pull to my hip and this other hand's gonna rotate him. So as he steps, I anticipate that step, I turn and he's down. So again, I anticipate his step forward here. I'm pulling to my hip and catch him. He's stepping, get this anticipation. I'm gonna do it from another angle here. So again, my partner steps. As he comes forward, I'm anticipating that. So the next technique we're gonna do is Osotagari. Osotagari means major outer reap. So it, it's, you have to remember that this isn't a trip as much as it is, I'm gonna remove his leg from him, okay? What's really important on this one is the kazushi on this one, or the decentralization of balance. So as he steps forward, I'm gonna meet that step by stepping out at a 45 degree angle. As I do that, I'm gonna turn my chest too. So the kazushi on this is with this left hand to begin, and I'm gonna look at my watch. So it creates the angle for me and puts all of his weight on this back heel. So he's already off balance. So each time he steps forward, I'm gonna to step to that 45 degree angle and I'm looking at my watch. The next part of this, as I step, this foot has to step past the line of his heels. So this is what creates his off balance. If I don't step past the line of his heels, I'll never have the leverage to take him down. So he steps forward, I step past the line of his heels. As, as I'm coming forward, my right knee is gonna come up and this hand is gonna come straight across my chest. The other hand is gonna rotate the far so shoulder. So again, as he steps forward, I'm here. This knee comes up and reaping, it's gonna come through and go calf to calf. And I don't wanna stop. My idea is to take my reaping foot to the ceiling. So my chest is gonna go down, I'm gonna have a rotation. 
like I'm trying to take my right hand and put it on my left foot. So again, he steps back, I step out, the knee comes up, and we do a sort of guard. So change angles here. So you, you can see the, the angle change on the Kazushi when I step out to that 45. Step up, foot, and we throw. Come on this side. So again, pay attention to the, to the uh, reaping leg, my right leg, as he steps here. As this leg comes up, it's gonna to go towards the ceiling, which is what takes his feet out from underneath him. The Kazushi tilts him, the reaping leg comes up, so it's an easy sweep right there, or reap. Okay, so our third technique is gonna be Kouchi Gari, or minor inner reap. Um, it's very similar to Deashi Hirai, but we're gonna do the same foot, but from the inside. So one of the things that that'll help you decide when you're doing this one is where your opponent is standing in, in relation to you. So if our front feet are lined up, I can't reap the inside. So I wanna stay almost square to him. And again, I'm gonna catch his movement coming forward. So when we're in here, as this foot steps forward, I'm anticipating it coming forward. So all I'm gonna do on this one is, when I step, I'm not gonna step with him, I'm gonna to step to my heel. What this does is you can tell it turns my chest to this 45 degree angle so that I can make this attack. The foot, the reaping foot does the same thing. I'm gonna turn my toes down, my toes never leave the mat. I'm gonna create the curve in my foot here and I'm gonna catch that right behind his heel here. I don't wanna lift up because it lifts my opponent up. What I wanna do is I wanna reap it and just elongate it so that we off balance him. The Kazushi on this one is a bit different. So as, as I'm getting him to step forward, I'm gonna give him a little pull to make this step just a hair longer than it would normally be. So as he pulls, it gives me time to get here. Once I sweep, both of my elbows will go to the mat at that 45 degree angle here. Or you'll hear people say it as the pinkies go to the ground. So stay right there. So as I step, it becomes here. Or you'll see the elbows come down. Either way, it creates the Kazushi going at this 45 degree angle and his foot's not there anymore to be able to hold him up. So again, as he comes forward, I'm coming to the inside of this foot right there. And the Kazushi, I'm gonna give him a little pull to elongate. One more time. Back. So I'm gonna catch right there. Yeah. Right there. It's changing. So again, he's back. I step to my heel to create that angle right there. Going down on this one. And we have the takedown right there. So one more time this way. So again, pay attention to the angle change of my chest. So as he comes here, I'm facing at a 45 degree angle to him. This will conclude the judo portion of modern martial arts. Um, if you're interested in learning judo, you can come to Reading Martial Arts. We have multiple judo classes available on different times. Um, we have kids classes as well as adults. We'd love to have you. Just check our readingmartialarts.com webpage or check social media. Okay, that's gonna wrap up episode 15 of Training to Survive 1996 cable television martial arts and fitness program. 
with some modern segments in it to bring us into the uh, into the modern era. So in the show, you see a mix of old standard definition video. A lot of that we re-edit, okay, and upscale it to HD, as well as, you know, tonight we had some, uh, we did all of our lead-ins, uh, introductions and closing in, uh, in high definition, and that's just gonna kind of mix around. We're actually gonna bring you a show here in the future on how we, how we made the show. And we're gonna look at some of the editing techniques that we used back in that day, and then how we're making them work today to re-edit the show so that's going to be a, an addition coming up soon but anyway we really hope you enjoyed it please support us we want to keep this going but we need likes we need views we need subscriptions we need shares okay we're without sponsorship so if you want to see this great martial arts content to continue help us boost the channel along and get those views up there where they need to be if you've got any questions comments you can leave them in the section below or you can uh, email me. My information is here. I'm, I'm very easy to find. If you're interested in martial arts training videos, we have an abundance of those as well. And your buying those does support uh, our, our channel uh, and so forth. Other than that, uh, we hope everyone out there has a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year as we head into the Christmas season of 2022 and the new year for 2023. Y'all stay he healthy, stay safe, train hard, and we'll see you on future editions of Training to Survive.